Um, righty ho, thanks for coming. Uh, the title will be explained later, I promise. <laughs> so, okay, first off, uh, myself, I am the controversially titled head of DevOps at Call Credit. You, you, did, uh, you did ask the Twitter sphere I what did. your job title should be, though. And you? it was typically helpful. <laughs> um, yes, and I'm Chris. Hello. <laughs> They call me this at the moment, but it's, it's bound to change next month or, or next year as we decide to do something else. Yeah, so. we, an agile approach to um, job titles. Job titles, I like to yes. Think of it, yeah. Okay, so it's quite weird being here. So 12 months ago, I remember sitting in the main auditorium, uh, listening to Mary, wide-eyed, and going, oh, this is all awesome stuff, and getting very excited uh, about it. And now, if someone had told me then, I'd be up here, it's only a year later, talking about things to people, I'd have laughed. However, I'm going to start off today with a hypothesis or possibly a theory. I should know, being a mathematician. Um, that is, all organizations have got the right people within them to enable them to make an order of magnitude improvement on how they operate. So a proper step change in where, where we are. The organizational structure is the key to defining whether they're able to do that or not. So we'll dive into a little bit of history. but. Bearing in mind that hypothesis, it's worth me just telling you what, what we think we're going to try and talk about. So we're going to try and explain how we have changed our organisational structure and that has enabled this journey to continuous delivery, enabled the journey through DevOps, changing people's attitudes both above us and the guys on the ground, the engineers on the ground. So we come from Call Credit. And so Call Credit is about 15 years old, and it was a, a brainchild of the Skipton Building Society. Now, who'd have thought the Skipton Building Society <laughs> would have an idea to challenge the two big credit reference agencies in the UK, Experian and Equifax, and be a challenger to those two big foreign organisations to build a, credit a, a British credit reference agency for the UK. But that's what they did. And the, 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 the call credit started 15 years ago. So we've got real constraints around us in terms of how we operate. And it's dead interesting to see another talk on this track later on in terms of you're in the financial services industry, you can't do DevOps, you can't do continuous delivery. And so this is about our changing the culture and changing our practices to prove that we can and we, we are actually practicing what we're preaching and we are getting a faster rate of change in our operational environment. So 15 years ago, as you say, we got set up. So what followed was a decade and a half of really quite dramatic growth. Um, so it's been fairly constant and a kind of yes. upwards arrow. We're now up to, I think, about 1,300 people across... A few countries, Lithuania, China, yeah. maybe Spain. Ma mainly in the UK. But, but mainly but in the again, UK. again, spread around multiple locations in the UK. We're now on to our third set of owners since, uh, we, since uh, the Skipton Brun Society started Call yep. Credit 15 years ago. So that rapid growth, as I'm sure anyone who's worked in a small company that's got bigger and bigger knows, starts to chuck up some challenges. I'd say so. so when you start off, everyone working together and knowing Bob in the IT department, and you know, if a server needs kicking, you can just go and kick it yourself, guys. Um, so about two years ago, this will make sense in a minute, I promise. About two years ago, uh, the latest set of owners came in. Um, the Americans arrived. Yes. Uh, with sort of grand plans, basically. So they arrive and goes, hi, guys, we think you're awesome. Um, we need you to be order of magnitude, more awesome. We want to grow this company, double the size in five years. So where we were at was pretty much everyone was running as fast as they could and going exactly as far as that hamster is. Um, so clearly, to be able to achieve this doubling of the, um, the size of the company, something had to change. What we needed to be was more like this hamster <laughs> <laughs> who can get around a bit more and, and actually move when he runs. Um, just avoid stairs. <laughs> I say that from experience, my poor hamster. So, that was the target. Um, 
there wasn't really any deliberate strategy around continuous delivery at that juncture, no. but I think it was you know, fairly obvious to some of the more technical ones among us on the ground that that was the only way we were going to get to, to be able to do this delivering faster, more reliably, all those other R's, rapidly, repeatedly, no more, I don't know. Right. Any mathematicians in the room? Excellent. Definition of the butterfly effect? Nailed it. The spooky word was, was there in the I haven't got definition. spooky in there, actually. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so had I not interrupted you, you'd probably have said that the, um, it's a sensitive dependence on initial conditions, which is a small change in one set of deterministic nonlinear system can result in large differences in a later state. As you said, small changes, spooky effect, big changes. Good summary. So in our case, the small change came from the IT director changing roles. Yep. So he came from, so by this point, we had a nice organization where we had a massive brick wall separating the development teams from the operational teams. So all good. Um, the IT director moved roles, climbed over the brick wall, came down the other end of the office to, um, to lead as an IT delivery director, was Yes, it? he called himself was. delivery. And yep. So we were now delivery. We weren't developers anymore, we were deliverers. Yes. Um, so, and at that time, the, so I guess he asked some of the people, some of the project managers, why, why they couldn't deliver, what was causing them to be late. Um, their excuse wasn't because waterfall. Uh, it was because I can't get operational guys to deploy stuff. So he brought some of the operations people <coughs> along with him across the wall. Yeah. Um, I think at the time, this is what the project managers were expecting and hoping for. Um, button pushing monkeys to do their deployments, um, which <laughs> some of them involved three page Word documents that you had to follow on a dozen servers. Four in the morning, obviously, you can't do it any time during the day um, and expect them not to make mistakes. Clearly, that went very well. Yes. Um, so as the monkeys came across with the IT delivery director at the time, so, so some of the monkeys suggested, maybe we don't want that. Um, and someone mentioned the word DevOps. And we went, you what now? Who's that? Uh, so we looked into that. And what I then thought was coming, what I could see, Rockstar DBAs. Yeah. So if you've got your DevOps bingo cards, this is the only thing I can think of as metal as a service. <laughs> assume that's what it means anyway. <laughs> so yeah. So we were going to have Rockstar DBAs that were going to be amazing and change the world and everything would be awesome. My idea of Rockstars is very different to, uh, to Ian's. This is my idea of, of Rockstars. They're just not pretty. No, no. Well, you know, Rockstars don't need to be pretty to be effective, do they? <laughs> <laughs> we can have a vote on that maybe later. But actually, what we really got... There you go. That's ...are people, team. real <laughs> live people. That's what they really like. He did really not want to be in this photo. And these aren't all DBAs, so uh, ah. spot the uh, Linux uh, system administrator amongst <laughs> these guys. It's a mystery. <laughs> it's a mystery. <laughs> Looks like two of them, yeah. We've got a kind of red herring beardy yeah, DBA yeah. in there yeah. as well. He, he just, is a rock star Just to DBA. throw you yes. off. <laughs> but yeah, the guy you're thinking is the guy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we had our potential rock star DBAs and... Um, Lean sysadmins, agile sysadmins. Um, at this point, I don't know if any alarm bells are ringing, but it's sounding awfully like what we did was create a DevOps team. Technically, there were two teams, so that's OK. Um, <laughs> but we did it very cognizant of, of what we wanted to do, which was this. So it absolutely wasn't to create a team to do all the handoffs and handhold all the things, but to actually start to move the development operations closer together to start to break down that brick wall. So that was our grand aim. We didn't call them uh, DevOps team. No. And it, this was a bit of a battle over the last 18 months. Still where is. the business, everyone, oh, the DevOps team. But we, we actually gave them roles, the two teams roles, didn't we? We did. System build and platform build. So the idea of both of those teams was to improve the stuff. 
improve how we build servers, platform build. And the system build, improve how we build systems. And those guys were in, embedded in the teams, into the uh, delivery teams. Absolutely. So once we had the people, we had that term. <laughs> what were we going to do with it? How are we going to work out what, what the hell to do? So we had this organization. We knew we needed to get things moving faster. So what we used was this. And again, as all things DevOps and continuous deployee comes from, it kind of starts from that Toyota uh, t improvement cata. So I've put the link there to Crisp, cause, and there's a good page on it, really useful. So the idea behind what we did was to define now what we looked like, brutally honest in terms of things like our deployments, uh, in terms of our environments, how confident we were in that they looked like they were. Mm -hmm. if, if someone attacked them with a pickaxe, how easily we could rebuild them. Not. Uh, and then we defined awesome. And our awesome was very much not where we necessarily was, OK, well, we could do this. It was awesome. It was Nirvana. It was a desert island with me sitting around drinking pina coladas out of a coconut or a pineapple. That made more sense. <laughs> um, the next thing you do is define our next target condition. So this is our next, our next step, our next small thing, our next state. So it might be something as small as going from a three-page Word document to a half-page Word document. <laughs> this is better. This is moving forward. And then the very next steps we take to start to get to that target condition. So hence, steps were awesome. Totally makes sense. So off the back of this, um, we talked about not only tools. So I think when we all started, we thought, brilliant, we can get some deployment tools in. We can get some stuff that will help us spin up VMs and do that. But we ended up talking lots about culture, changes in language, how people think, how projects were delivered. And we ended up with that particular poster. We ended up breaking it down into four sections. Culture, our monitoring and measuring, the environments, and continuous delivery itself. And again, we defined our now state and our awesome state. We got Octopus on it. We ended up using Octopus Deploy for, I think, that's how that snuck in. Um, people know what that is? Anyone? Why we've got scary skeletons on? It wasn't because it, wasn't it was Halloween. No? There we go. Bingo. Yeah. I haven't got a prize. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't promise anything. <laughs> Do you all know what walkie skeleton is? Right, if there is a no. Yeah. So the idea of the walkie skeleton is to get the minimum viable product all the way through from your dev environment all the way to production. Even if it is a hello world program, but the idea is you've got a monitored hello world screen. You've got unit tests around the hello world screen. It, you've got automated deployment of that hello world through every single environment. So rather than developers starting developing and they develop your application and they go, right, now what? How do we get it to integration? How do we get it to QA? How do we get it to CT? You've got the absolute minimum product to test every stage. And that's your walking skeleton. It ain't going to work. You're not going to sell it at that first iteration. But you know you can deploy it all the way through your pipeline. That's the walking skeleton. It gets you away from those horrible 18 month projects where you get to the end and go, right, we're going to deploy all the things now. Get one in for the weekend. This is going to be hell. Because by the time you've actually got it, you've deployed to the live environment hundreds of times already. It's a complete non event. Yep. Um, so, and the, the big reason, the big thing in terms of starting to talk about changing how we work and getting the uh, developers, the testers, the product managers, project managers at the time, on board with this was broadcasting. So the posters were one way we did it. We sent out really probably annoying weekly emails <laughs> um, about good things, highlighting where there was a single tiny spark of automation going, this is brilliant, guys, get on board. But also uh, the bad things. You highlighted fails in those uh, DevOps weekly reports pinpointing where things have gone wrong. And then 
what the plans were to improve it. So yeah, a, a big change in the culture is getting away from, and I think sort of obviously the stuff Jez was talking about this morning, getting away from that terror of failing and yeah. treating it as a learning experience and going, no, this is okay. I think it went wrong. It went wrong in the right way. Hooray. Um, this started to change people's language and the way they thought yeah. very, very slowly and very quietly, but they then did start to talk about walking skeletons. They started to understand what we meant by continuous deployment, uh, continuous delivery. Yeah. Not going to do continuous deployment, probably. Um, and clearly stating what the teams, what the new teams were there to do, to focus on the automation, to doing better things better. So, so this is the point I tried to find a um, clever slide that would neatly segue into Chris's bit. I couldn't, so a nice definition of segue. But what we had, what we'd taken was some operations guys, pulled them across the invisible force field barrier, started them working with the development teams to help deliver better teams better. Could this be the start of some kind of autonomous development team? I'm going to swap sides with you yeah, now, I'll so I can see the, uh, what, what's coming up next <laughs> and what I'm meant to be talking about. So, do I press that one? Yeah. Yeah, good. So, at the time, you can imagine stuff is 15 years old at this point. Well, not quite 15 years old, 13 years old. And so our products were pretty monolithic. They, they sort of reflected the, the way that they were built and the way that they were sold. So you, we had huge, huge, huge systems, completely um, uh, just everything built on top of them, just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. No separation, no breaking down into to smaller components. And that, that reflected how they were being sold. So our sales guys would go out with this system in mind. And of course, you all know sales guys, they never actually sell what you've got. So they always come back from the customers, ah, oh, right, they love it, but it's got to just do this other thing. It's got to do this something else. So of course, we developed into this culture of projects. So there, there was nothing continuous about constantly bolting on new features onto our great big monolithic applications. Now, when you're trying to change culture, that, that is a, a hard thing to get your head around. Because as you guys probably know, every company that is doing projects ends up entering the matrix. So you've got projects coming down in your verticals and you are organized, so certainly we were organized in functions. So we had um, uh, developers in the developer function run by a head of development. You had testers in a tester function run by a head of testing. You had BAs there, you had software architects, you had anything you can imagine, but they are separate. And of course, down here, You've got project manager needing to deliver that project for the customer. Of course, these guys are taking all the risk, but they haven't got much accountability of these guys. And these guys here in your functions, the head of dev isn't that interested in, in um, the delivery aspect. They want the guys to be trained, to have hack days, to, to use all these new techniques and, and not really about that mentality of delivery. So another thing that happened when our IT director came over, for the first time, projects were joined up under a common leader with functions. And that was our first glimpse into culture change that suddenly these guys and these guys had some shared objectives. For the first time, your head of development had an objective to deliver stuff, which was a little bit unheard of. Now, I can, I can talk about this, but you know the, the pros and cons of matrix management. You know that you get strong skills development. So your developers, your testers, 
share best practice amongst themselves and your skills improve. You know there is a certain flexibility there. A, 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 a developer ends up being flexible, but there's a con there in terms of uh, that, that flexibility. I think that model works well for a consultancy where, where you've got dev teams pulled together and work on a problem like a project. But what we were seeing most of all were the cons of matrix, matrix management. Lost product knowledge. This, this, this was the madness looking back. So you've got this situation where we're doing projects and a project team is pulled together with a load of developers, testers, BAs who don't know the product. And so they're having to learn straight away what it is, the code base, the product, what they're actually doing. They deliver, but then the worst thing, they're disbanded and they're put back into the pool and they've, they've lost. That, that product knowledge that they've gained is lost. It's gone to the winds. We have people moving between projects frequently. I, I, my heart wobbles when I think about and Ian was involved as well, weekly transfer window meetings where we as managers were getting together, what's the highest priority project, which project is on fire, which developer tester can we pull out of the lower priority project and plop into that higher priority project. I, I wince when I think about the hours I've spent in these transfer window it meetings. It seems sane at the time. It does, it does. You think you're doing it for the right reasons, but taking that step back for, and think about the people rather than the resources, uh, it, it seems mad. What's our other con? Little ownership of technical debt. Oh, you know, project team, you can see it. Yep, I've done my project, it's delivered, I'm off. There's no, there's no closing, there's no, right, how, are all the latest, are all the tests in version control? Um, have I actually made the code base better during this project? Or actually, have I made it worse? Have I made it more complex? Have I made it more unreadable because I've bolted on yet another feature onto this code base? So, little ownership of technical debt. Oh, I, I, I think back now. So, what we're trying to do here in this culture change is move away from the matrix and be far more like the A-team. So the A-team, it's a perfect analogy for, for a product team. So you've got people in there, close, they're tight, they're together, they're, they're, they're working for each other. They've all got independent skills. They, they have got their speciality, yeah? But they come together when they're locked in that big shed with the welding gear and the, uh, the car that they need to make, and they hit that deadline. They are busting through that gate with the thing that they've built, delivering it on time. They always need a little bit of help from externals. There's always an SME in the A-team that helps them along. It's not quite how I saw them. No, Ian sees uh, the, uh, the uh, product team more like You've you got to laugh there. Does anyone know what film this is? 1980s film. Hey. Goonies. <laughs> but the product teams, here is one of the, one of the product teams. Look, we've got real girls and everything <laughs> in no our beards. product teams. No beards. And very few beards. You know, you, you, you know Dan has got a bit, of a, a bit of a stubble going on there, but it's, it's not, not a Unix beard. It's not a wizard, is it? <laughs> and look, they're all happy as well. They're, they're all happy, happy to be in the photo. Mine, mine are content in their own way. <laughs> <laughs> so in building this organisational change, we're, we're, we're changing the culture. And so the plan was to create a culture, create an environment around a product team that protects them from all sorts of external influences and enables them to do good stuff, own it and deliver it. So some of the things that I was driving to protect the teams, first of all, was distractions. I'll, I'll pause for a sec so you can read the deal, but it, it gives a good opportunity to... Uh... Put on the crown, 
So, have any of you seen this one? So, the concept is that you've got to try and visualise your interruptions. You've, you've all been there, you're at your desk, an ops guy comes over or a product manager comes over. What do you think about this idea? What, what do you think? Could you, how long would it take you? What do you think of the blurp, blurp, blurp? So, can you imagine if they started talking and you started blowing up a red balloon, right? And for every 15 minutes, they're there interrupting you from your daily work, you blow up another red balloon. And so that is a visualization of how much a team is interrupted and disturbed during a day by the number of red balloons floating about the work area in that day. So focus, focus on tasks. Now, as we said earlier, we're in the financial services industry. I, I, I want security off my back, right? I do not want the developers, I don't want the, the engineering teams to have any access to private data. I, why, why would I want that? Why would I want private data anywhere near the developers? It, it just seems lunacy that, that in the past, there, there's, there's been that culture of, oh, it's, it's quicker if the, if the engineers can see what's going on with the data. No! Get the engineers to build their own data that is representative of live. I'm, I'm, I'm all flustered now that, that, uh, that this is even questioned at times to, for uh, an engineering team to have be anywhere near private data. No, no. Right, here's my controversial bit. If there's, if there's developers in the room... The Matrix again. I do not want engineers, developers, testers, development teams to be anywhere near production. I don't want it. I don't want my engineers to be able to get onto production. No matter what they say, Oh, we, we need access. Why, why do you need access? Well, to help, with, to help with deployments. No, 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 no. Maybe I give you access. Well, no, I do. I want you to have access to the tools that can deploy to live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no way do I want you to get into production. That's not your skill set. That's, that's not what you're good at. Oh, but what about if there's problems? If there's problems, you don't fix them in production, do you? If there's a problem with production and it hasn't been highlighted through all of your pipeline, then your pipeline is wrong. Get the code back to dev and duplicate that error in live. It might be a data, it might be environment, it might be a systems, and re-put it back through the pipeline. And then that, of course, leads on to... Now, this is the most tenuous slide of the, <laughs> of the whole thing. Get all of your environments looking like production. Get them all the same. Use the same boxes, use the same OS, use the same version of the OS. Get, get the same version of your code and database all the way through every single environment. Does anyone know the names of the, uh, the oh, Matrix agents? The Goonies one was easy. Smith, yeah, 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 you got Smith. Oh, oh my gosh. No one loves the Matrix like you, Chris. Smith, <laughs> Jones. <laughs> Johnson, no, no Jackson. Jackson, Johnson, Thompson. <laughs> there we are. It's tenuous, I know. And, I, I and there was a prize for that one too, sorry. Yeah, and you've all failed. <laughs> okay. This is you now, isn't it? Uh-huh. So, um, missing piece of the jigsaw. So, organisational change was already starting to make differences. Um, prior to this, People like myself and Chris, we talked about these things for ages. We'd looked at the Spotify model and gone, that is so cool. We should totally do this. And hadn't. Yeah. And we did step back and question, well, why didn't we do this? And actually, an organization the size of the one we were dealing with, a thousand plus people, we didn't have the ability to make those decisions, to yeah. make those changes. Yeah. And we look like we've got authority. <laughs> do we? <laughs> um, okay. So... The other thing, the missing piece of the jigsaw, the final enabler was the bringing in of a CTO. Yep. So having someone with 
an ounce of technical nous at the big top table, all of a sudden change the business from being driven by sales, deliveries, to actually going, we're a technology company here. Yeah. We need to start addressing things like technical debt. So all the stuff the guys are talking about, the automation, they're coming around again and fixing things, the caring about the how your thing runs in live, not that you tick the box for the client to say, yeah, there's a new feature. Up and down like a yo-yo, but it's got a new feature. Um, makes that difference. So regardless, I think, of you know, how strong the grassroots feel, we need to change and we know the right things to do, it takes that enabler, a CEO, a CTO, a CIO, whatever, uh, someone who is on the exec yep. um, to be able to go, just give it the yes. It's as easy as that. They just need to go, yes. Again, to enable the people to make the changes they know they need to make yes. at any level. So, yeah, CTOs are important. Who knew? <laughs> Don't tell him. <laughs> We're big headed. Go to that. <laughs> Learnings. Right. I was going to say something here, wasn't it? Product I? teams. Chris to say some stuff. Chris to say some stuff. I'll make some notes because it's not on the. Uh, um, the so. The, 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 big, the big thing, the big learning that the, the people on the ground, the people learned this themselves, that it's better when, when the teams care. It's, it, it just is better when the teams understand their route to production. You know, I'm talking to the converted here. You're at a pipeline bleeding conference. So it is better when, when the, the engineers on the ground understand their product and care about what happens. Strong monitoring, strong uh, uh, routes alive. That, that's, that's the big, big learnings from this change of culture. And it turns out, if you have people in the teams <coughs> who are specifically tasked with a focus on automation, you get loads more automation. It's a no-brainer, but again, looking back on it, that's why we didn't, because no one was really empowered to, to really care. So, so that goes for server builds, middleware deployment, things like databases, IIS if you're on Windows or whatever, and scaling. So the, the mere idea that you can automatically start scaling stuff out rather than just to purchase massive amounts of tin was, was kind of oddly new. Um, oh, my personal, personal joy was death to manual deployments, uh, which is a phrase I've lifted from a... Uh, blog by Eric Minnick of Urban Code. It's well worth the read. But again, getting away from those 4 a.m. nightmares, the stress, the pressure of having to get it right. Did you definitely follow this? Yes, I think so. Give me more coffee. Uh, again, biggest achievement unlocked. So going back to the original hypothesis, all the way through from the CTO going to people like myself and Chris, yes, you can start to rearrange your, how your teams are right the way down to the grassroots developers and us being able to say to them, yes, you can start looking at the tools you need, you can change your methodologies. Yeah, you can, you can perform care and maintenance, you can, you can bring your changes through. It's the organisational structure that defines whether we can do that. If we still had the old structure, there, we would it's probably still, still be in way. the same old place, we'd be sales driven, we'd have worse and worse Frankenstein environments that were getting less and less supportable. So I'm going to give that a quad erat demonstrandum, as they say in Wales. <laughs> you know, not, every, <laughs> not everything is went perfectly or is going perfectly or is solved. Culture change, it turns out, is absolutely the hardest thing in the universe to do. Don't underestimate it. Don't underestimate trying to tell the developers and explain to them why they don't need that access to production. Don't underestimate how hard it is to convince the op guys that they're not helping by fixing live. Fixing live. Changing you, live. Euphemisms yes. like drift. It's not. You've changed in live. Um, so we've still got those problems. Uh, there's still developers who don't see why they should give a damn about how things are running in production. Well, I've done my job. I've written some code whoosh, yeah. over the wall. Um, there are still teams and individuals unwilling to change how they work, but some of the good stuff is coming from the teams where we've got sort of centers of excellence, and people are going, well, they're deploying every week. Why, why, why are you doing every six months? P 
peer pressure really helps. Yeah. So getting it fixed in, in some small places, get the wins where you can, everyone else eventually has to follow on. So what we'd actually done is identified and created some exciting new bottlenecks by getting rid of other ones, which is always good. Um, so <laughs> two-speed IT is a phrase that's used in, for all sorts of things. To me, it kind of means we've moved some bits forward. We can spin up 100 servers overnight. Brilliant. If I need some extra storage for them at the moment, however, there's a three-month process. It has to go through in a meeting and then a budget sign-off, and this is not ideal. Um, the ops guys are struggling still, and we should have foreseen this, to, to cope with uh, hundreds of VMs appearing, disappearing. It's like, well, that's, no, it's gone. They don't, that's, that's not the, the world they're used to, um, basically. Also, pipeline isn't from, just from developers out to production. My idea of pipeline is actually from requirements, from stories. And of course, we've really enabled the product teams now, and we've got product owners that can't keep up. They cannot feed the, the, the machine that we've created. They, so there are developers, development teams, wide open mouths with a not enough qualified stories that they can actually start on. He's all right, though. He, he's, uh, he's got a product owner <laughs> that is absolutely on it. But many of the product teams are running dry. So you can only go through, right, this time box is about care and maintenance. You can only do that so often. So that's one of the, the interesting bottlenecks that, that we've created ourselves. And one which probably surprises nobody. Uh, security practices, especially since we have all this governance and constraints around us, is a massive bottleneck. We've not done the job to get security on board. Their practices are now an absolute bottleneck there. Yeah. Designed for a company, a, a fine fintech company from 10, 15 years ago. Yes. Uh, they've yes. not moved on, so we've got work to do there. Continuous delivery is a complete enigma to them at the moment. Yeah. And so that's, that's a mindset change aiming at both levels. The, 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 the bosses of the security, but also, you know, like we've done that mindset change at the ground. Get those guys who are working at the end of every cycle with the product teams, get them working right at the beginning of the cycle. Get them to understand what the products are. Get them to understand what we're trying to achieve. So I think this is how security sees themselves as policemen, whereas we want them to be enablers for us to deliver stuff securely. Yeah. Work in progress. Anyway, creating all these bottlenecks is absolutely fine and dandy and brilliant. It means we're moving forward. Um, stealing quotes from the Phoenix Project, uh, anywhere you focus other than the constraint is illusion. So again, we're always going to be uncovering new bottlenecks. Yep. That's good. That means we're moving forward. OK. Assorted other things we learned. So changing, changing culture is hard. and. There is always one person in the culture that feels more important than the others. So we've termed it collaborative leadership is key. There is no point for the company if I'm playing that card with my, with my peers in my team, other, other uh, heads of product delivery. There's, I've got to give and take. I know I need them to succeed for, for their products that they own if I'm going to succeed as well. So I'm, I'm not seeing my teams as, as an island. I need to share that leadership. I need to share those decisions and not just focus on me. We've got to make the whole company better. One thing I've definitely learned during putting this presentation together is that you really need <coughs> to make those. I do, but not the sequels. It's, it's, got, to be, it's got to be the first <laughs> one. Embedding the thinking into the development teams. We talked earlier on about one of Ian's teams, System Build. So their, their role in the product teams is to get that thinking across. Think about your deployments. Think about your route to life. Think about your pipeline. It's not about, and I think some companies do DevOps like this, you've got a DevOps engineer and they are going to code the deployments. It's not about that. It's embedding the thinking because Ian's only got a finite number of people in that team. So he needs to be dropping people into the team, sharing and embedding the thinking so that those guys can then go on to the, the next case, to the next bottleneck, leaving behind a team 
that wants to own and, and automate their um, production. I, sitting out there, I was thinking, oh, I've got a fantastic quote here that developers, you know, they, they like writing code. So yeah, get the developers to, to code the deployments. And I'm thinking, where did I get that quote from? And it was on the train when we were practicing this last night and I rubbed it off you. So I do apologize uh, um, if you've heard that quote already when Ian says it later on. Okay, this is much harder with remote teams. Um, not uns un insurmountable. Uh, you just have to be very cognizant of the satellite where we're not all the time. They will tend towards creating their own little culture. So that broadcast piece is ever so much more important than getting everyone on board with the same things we're talking about, the same language, the same sorts of words. Yeah. <laughs> and don't try and do all the things at once. We certainly did. To begin with, we had all these exciting ideas. We had our poster. It was like, we're going to do all these things this year. We called it Project Evolution, oh. would you believe? We're not going to incrementally get there. We are going to evolve. We are going to be so different next week. And uh, it didn't work. No. <laughs> Lesson learned. Lesson we, we learned. We put that behind us and used it as a learning opportunity. <laughs> um, yeah, iterate towards it. Understand that target. So again, that's where that improvement kata comes in. Understate what, understand what your next step is. So we've got awesome. That's the direction we're aiming. But what's your next step? What's your next state? Iterate. OK, what next? So for me, uh, we've now got the IT operations teams who, again, started to tear down that big wall. So there are people, because of some of the FSA reg regulations, we can't have... FCA, you know. FCA, sorry. Keep doing that. Same lot. <laughs> uh, we can't have a full-on dev, ops, everyone in those teams. There has to be a separation between operations and the people who can actually write the code. But those IT ops teams are now reorganizing themselves to line up with the um, product with model. The so again, we've got a, a, a better stream of of understanding. They've got specialists and they start to talk and care about each other. So our, our developers now know the guy who's going to be woken up when he's on page of duty, yeah. which is nice. So hopefully heading nearer to that Venn diagram and we can start to dissolve those pulling together teams as a, as a concept. And mine is, is lining up everything. I'm now helping to line up our product owners so they can get their priorities right into the product teams, so we're not faced with this void of, of good stories into the, into the uh, uh, scrum sprints. So it's just lining everyone up in your pipeline rather than just fixing one area. There we go. Any questions? Hang on, you all meant to laugh before you. You haven't even read it, look. <laughs> you haven't even read it. You meant to laugh before you put your hands up. <laughs> 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 I'll laugh later. First, I'd sort of like say thank you because it feels like you just reflected my company and the state that it's in, and some of the the issues and changes we're trying to make at the same same time. So, really good timing on on that. Um, are you aware of, of ING, the, the bank, Dutch bank? Yeah. Um, the the sponsor, same world. sponsor used to sponsor Renault in the Formula One. That they. they gone through this whole process as well and the whole regulatory side of it so um, they've got some good videos the, the guy who does the rounds on that I'm sure you know um, and then the, the other in the DevOps world the concept of a DevOps team is considered a sort of a no-no um, do you still have a, a DevOps team or is it all product teams now we have system build and platform build teams uh, who I guess have a focus on a lot of the things that we talk, we're talking about when we call DevOps. So the big controversy with my title, Head of DevOps, what the, does that actually mean? Can you do that? I'm kind of OK with that, because yes, you can kind of push that agenda, push that way of working, push that way of thinking. Should you have a DevOps team? No, that doesn't kind of work. You need devs and operations guys, by definition yeah. of the portmanteau. Yeah. Uh, so, Depends what you mean. So we have teams who are focused on specific things, but it's all... So one of your teams, everyone in that team is embedded in the product teams, yep. and they are changing the thinking in the team. And when they've managed to change the thinking in the team and, and got the team thinking in a DevOps way, they move on and spend more time with other teams. Your platform build team, that's about automating the production of platforms, be it 
in VMs, be it on hardware, be it in the cloud. It, that is their job. And so I'm, I'm comfortable that neither of those is a DevOps team. I visited a company, um, uh, with, <laughs> yeah. uh, half of our developers are in Kaunas in Lithuania, and I visited uh, another company that, uh, that uh, has, has these problems. And they had a hilarious uh, question for me. They said, right, we've created our DevOps team, but our developers really hate them because <laughs> what they're doing, they're, they've stopped the developers actually accessing these, these servers, and they're, they're hampering the deployments. So I said, well, you haven't created a DevOps team. You've created another ops team. That's what you've done. You, you've, you've moved the wall to, so ops is bigger and, and dev is actually more constrained. What? <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with, with what we've done, but it's, it's a fine line. It, it is a fine line. I don't think it matters what you call them as long as you're working in the right way. It sounds similar to what we've done. Good. So in a year's time, we'll be here <laughs> watching you and the story of uh, IMG. Over in the, oh, in the corner there? Don't mind, oh. pick one. <laughs> he was first, he was first. <laughs> <laughs> so egalitarian. <laughs> and Rob will only ask an awkward question. Yeah, yeah, we're trying to keep the microphone yeah. away from Rob. How long we got? <laughs> uh, I just wanted to know, how did you guys handle the, any uh, post-launch issues uh, that... Uh, uh, needed immediate attention, so it kind of uh, has to go in immediately without hampering the uh, production system. Because obviously uh, there is no accessibility for the concept uh, to the production environment. So just want, wanted to know how you guys handled it. So for me, those occasions, and again, this is the uh, the conversation we we have with the operations guys, and they're like, we're like, stop just changing stuff. But but we need to change stuff in life. Keep it going. How many times in the last X years have we actually had a point where live service is down and an actual code change is what is needed to bring it back up again? I would say they are very few and far between. So we have nice pipelines in places, and where we do, we should have a nice quick way of getting the code in, checked, regression tested, performance tested, whatever you need to do to get the small fix into live. So there's no excuse to not, not use that same pipeline. And again, the product teams, these autonomous product teams, have everything they need in them to get from code to, 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 to deploying and including doing the deployment uh, in, in the proper way. So actually having to just fix live, I, I genuinely have not seen an occasion when that's needed to be done in the last year. But it's a, it's a mental change as well. Of course, we didn't go uh, uh, project, 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 product, psh, everything's fixed. So we had to implement the mentality of drift reports. Yeah. We, we did. We, we were showing and creating evidence to show that ops were changing database structure in live in order to fix something. And of course, if they've done that, the next time the product team or, or any team with, a, with any form of deployment gets to that live machine, it fails. And so we did what Jez Humble does and creates stats and evidence. And so we were regularly running drift reports. And the moment a change went in, be it via an RFC or not, we could be saying, excuse me, we can't deliver now because live has changed. And so there was an element of evidence and proof in order to change their mentality. Because the RFC process, our change process, did not know it was happening. Because, oh no, it's under this cloud of operational fix at two in the morning on the end of a, an SMS or an emergency call that this stuff, this stuff was going on. Yeah? OK. It's not fast. There's a microphone. <laughs> You guys made reference to knocking down walls, and I was wondering if you have learned anything around physical space with this transformation. As have you had to make any changes, and how? It, it's dead funny you should say that because um, over the last year there was a big push at our facilities, our building managers, to get all of our um, engineers, BAs, um, uh, scrum masters all on the same floor, and. We finally managed that in the first week of January this year. So we have got a single floor in our head office in Leeds 
with all of the engineering teams, and they've all got their own space with a collaboration space. So, so the teams within their sort of product families sit together. And that includes the product owners? That yep. includes the... There's hot desks for product owners, so they spend half of their time down with the product teams. That includes the DBAs if you've got one in your team, or yep. the application delivery engineers yep. from the system build team. So but yeah, that makes a big difference. Makes that's it where the location, like half of our developers are in, in, uh, in Lithuania. And so they sit in their product teams, but we've invested heavily in strong uh, at desk video conferencing, you know, via Skype, but you need the infrastructure to, to make it happen. So we've got uh, developers doing uh, uh, peer review and pair programming over Skype. That sort of intimate, you know, your partner is in your ears and you're both. Uh, reviewing a single screen, but you're, you're hundreds of miles away. That sort of investment we made as well. Yeah. Time for one more question. Come on then, Rob. <laughs> um, firstly, thanks for a really engaging talk. And now I want to just take you back to the slide where you showed the red balloons. Um, so my question is... Oh, it's miles away, isn't it? So to me, that represents the context switch overhead of yes. continually yep. being interrupted. Yep. Now, the, so the nature of a lot of operations team is that that's what they're set up to focus on, dealing with the interrupts. Did you do any analysis around varying the rate of interrupt to see what happened to the productivity of the teams? No. We, it was, we knew that it was a problem. Now, th these are our product teams rather than the operations teams. So uh, what... It's, it, I, I titter a little bit because we've talked to you for an hour about culture change and change, and we haven't actually described what our team structure looks like anymore. So you need to read the book that, uh, that will be... But <laughs> the, 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 the culture, the, the actual structure of the teams, we went significant change, and we built a line management structure and a scrum structure in order to protect the teams. I, I tried to bring that out at the beginning, to protect the teams from these interruptions. So regular ceremonies, regular events where new stories can be um, broadcast to the team by the product owners and a structure around them. So if there's operational fires, it's not the engineers that are called first. It's a, another person, a manager, who is associated with those teams that can act as that, right, do you, do you really, really need to talk to the teams? And key to that is the, um, the, the business product owner yeah. caring about their product and how it runs in life, not just caring about the sales and things, but being able to see the whites of the eyes of the guys who are taking the calls from the annoying clients and going, this is your yeah. product, it's not yeah. working, you need to give a toss. Yes, absolutely. So you know, we've, we're trying to develop a culture with our operations team is, if you've got a problem, you don't come to the, the dev team, you come to the product owner because it's their product and they ought to care. And they are the ones that can get those high priority stories queue jumped into the next time box. Because, again, if you're, on, if you're an operational thing, actually the latest fire is always the most important thing. But not having the whole business context makes it tricky to, to understand where that sits in the grand scheme of things. Becky's going to kill you, she's going to kill you. Thank you very much, Ian and Chris. <laughs>